Bonada, good morning everyone and welcome to day three of our online annual conference. The theme of today is Building Back Fairer and is sponsored by Miris and United Welsh. A huge thank you to all of our conference sponsors over the past few days, not least to Clwyd Allen and Digital Communities Wales who sponsored the main conference. We're really looking forward to a day of really important discussion about valuing key workers, of challenging racism, hearing from experts by experience, and of course, looking forward to the Senate elections in seven weeks time. Over the past year, the importance of our key workers has become more evident than ever. Our homelessness and housing support workers have got thousands of people off the streets, kept them safe from COVID, and made sure that they had the support that they need despite all of the restrictions. I remember a year ago being worried that we would see hundreds of people experiencing homelessness die from COVID because we know about the underlying health conditions, we know about the vulnerabilities that they faced in congregate settings or sleeping on the streets and it's huge credit to our frontline workers that that hasn't happened, that the vast majority have been protected from this virus and continue to be supported to survive these really challenging times. Our care workers have also been absolutely fantastic, whether it's supporting older people in care homes or people with learning disabilities in supported living settings. They, despite not being paid much and not being recognised much at all, have been the heroes throughout this pandemic. This session today recognises those incredible efforts of homelessness, housing, support and care workers across Wales, but begs the question, how do we build back fairer if we're not valuing those workers for what they do? We know that historically they've been paid some of the lowest wages in Wales and it's high time that we pay them more. With the upcoming Senate elections, we've got a real opportunity to make our voices heard about the importance of this issue. And I'm really delighted that we've got a fantastic panel here to share their expertise, experience and insight. We've got Adrian Roper, who's Chief Executive of Katrevi Cymru, who've been supporting people with learning disabilities across the length and breadth of Wales throughout this pandemic. Really pleased to have Rachel Marshall from the Frontline Network. who will be talking about the experiences of homelessness frontline staff and I'm really, really pleased to welcome Joe Glasgow from Unite the Union, who's been a long standing champion of both paid and unpaid carers in our system. And will share her perspective as a union representative, but also as a champion for unpaid carers over the past decade. First up, I'd love to welcome Adrian Roper to share his reflections on this important issue. Hello. Okay, I've got through the, I've got through the tunnel. I'm and I'm here. I hope being looked at by you, um, but I can't see you. Uh, anyway, um, on with the show. Um, yeah, I'm Adrian Roper, Chief Executive of Cartrevi Company. Supports people with learning disabilities uh, all over Wales. We employ about twelve hundred staff, uh, and I'm sad to say uh, that the vast majority of them uh, are on the national minimum wage. We were established in 1989 to help get people with learning disabilities out of state run uh, hospitals and, and hostels and, and back into their home communities. And I think we saw ourselves as, as cutting edge third sector champions of person centered support and, and that that was the reason, uh, the only reason why government was uh, was switching services from the, from the state into organisations like ourselves. Uh, but back in 1989, our terms and conditions were the same as local authority staff based on national collective bargaining. But year by year, throughout the 1990s, things started to go wrong. Um, central government froze the amount it paid to local authorities for our services, and our pay scales gradually fell behind those of our colleagues in the state sector. Even though we had a trade union agreement, the arrangements for national collective bargaining only applied to local government employees. To make matters worse, we began to see our services being retended and contracts awarded to the lowest bidder and a whole new downward pressure on pay levels. <clears throat> then in 2008, we had the start of a decade of austerity and deep cuts to public services. Consequently, we had no funding uplifts and our pay levels barely moved uh, for 10 years. By the time the national minimum wage was introduced in 2016, 
our support workers were only paid pennies more than the minimum and the annual increase meant that they were all soon on the minimum. Okay, it's been good that they have been having a pay lift um, uh, each year since 2016, but there are a couple of very big negatives about it too. Firstly, the national minimum wage is obviously intended to be paid to workers doing the least value work. So how does it make social care workers feel to see that their work is amongst the least valued in the country? That their professional training and accreditation counts for nothing? That their knowledge and skills, ensuring the safety, dignity and well-being of vulnerable people counts for nothing? That their empathy, patience and responsiveness to people's needs, even in the face of of emotional and physical challenges counts for nothing. And of course, let's not forget that they have put their own safety on the line to support people during the pandemic and have had to be the reliable rocks on which people depended at all hours of the day and night, the, uh, quite often without any contact with family. And, and we've heard the cases of support and care workers who've been the only support source of compassion for people as they've died. Right now, all of that counts for nothing. They'd be earning the same wage from wearing a sandwich board, advertising donuts outside an arcade in Cardiff. But there's something else that's wrong about the national minimum wage situation, and that is that it offers nothing to the supervisors and middle managers of outsourced social care. Every year, since 2016, they have seen their pay differential eroded and the career path for support work undermined. The intensity and complexity and responsibility of frontline care management roles is really not for the faint hearted. And yet they can end up taking home less pay than the staff they supervise. So lifting pay levels in social care is absolutely a matter of justice and merit. Everyone in social care, regardless of what sector they're in, deserves to be fairly rewarded for the vital and demanding work that they do. But there are other reasons for raising pay levels in social care. Low pay in social care is a significant contributor to the unequal pay gap between men and women in Wales. 87% of the Welsh social care workforce is female. That's nearly a quarter of the female working population of Wales, but only 10% of the care workforce is paid at or above the real living wage. It has all the hallmarks of systemic discrimination. So we should do something about it. Let's lift pay levels in care and reduce the gender pay gap. Another good re reason for lifting pay levels in care is that it will boost local economies. There are about 83,000 people working in social care and they are spread throughout every community, urban and rural, including all of our most deprived uh, area, economic areas. A boost to the income of social care workers is a boost to the income of their families and communities too. Let's remember that the national minimum wage is not enough to address working poverty or meet the ordinary costs of living. And let's also remember that the additional income earned will almost all be spent in local shops and on local suppliers, supporting other local jobs and keeping local businesses afloat. So let's lift pay levels in care and boost the Welsh economy, particularly the areas where it is most needed. And my final argument for lifting pay levels in care is that low pay leads to huge amounts of public money being wasted particularly wasted on continual recruitment and training. Staff turnover rates in social care vary across sectors, but in the outsourced social care sector, a recent study indicated that a third of the workforce quits their job every year. Another study estimated that it costs getting on for £4,000 to recruit and train a single care worker. So if we brought staff turnover rates down from 33% to a more healthy 15%, it could save the social care sector in Wales tens of millions of pounds every year. 
how could we reduce staff turnover by valuing care work in the most visible and practical way by paying decent wages. The Fair Work Commission has highlighted the unfairness of wages in social care. <clears throat> the recent white paper on the future of care has pointed in the right direction too, but without any timescales. What we need is some urgency and some action. And that's why organisations like Cartrevi and Miras and Camorth and other allies have come together to campaign. There is no doubt that paying fair wages for the care force workforce will cost a substantial outlay of public funds. There is also no basis for continuing to wait and hope that the Westminster system will deliver. It has promised to do so repeatedly since 2012, but nothing ever happens. Wales has tax raising powers and we urge our leaders to bite the bullet and use them. And we commit to playing our part to helping the citizens of Wales embrace such a tax. First and foremost, that means servicing the brilliant work that is being done by so many social care heroes every day. Let's use every media outlet possible to celebrate all that's good about care in Wales. But let's also address the shortcomings in the current system. We need a social care promise to sit alongside the new tax. <clears throat> Here's my suggested promise, that as much tax revenue as possible goes on frontline workers, delivering what people actually want as locally as possible and with a minimum of hassle and delay. I'll end my slide, sorry, I'll end my speech with a campaign slide. So you can see the hashtag and website link to our manifesto. I hope you will join the campaign and ask your candidates for the next Senate election to commit to the proper funding of social care and to the restoration of nationally agreed pay levels with a real living wage as a minimum. Thank you. Thanks so much, Adrian. That was a rousing start to our panel, um, but so well evidenced in terms of some of the causes, the consequences, uh, the impacts, um, but also uh, some really clear asks about what we can do and really interesting going into the Senate election, particularly with the tax varying powers, of you, as you've mentioned. Um, so please do get involved in the campaign, share it on social media, contact your candidates. Um, I'm delighted to welcome our next speaker now, uh, Rachel Marshall, uh, who is from the Frontline Network. Many of you will be aware that we've recently entered into a partnership with the Frontline Network. Um, we're running the Frontline Network Wales um, on behalf of the Frontline Network, um, who run these networks across the UK. We're really delighted to be playing our part in making sure that frontline workers have their voices heard within the homelessness, housing and support sector. We often spend a lot of time talking to managers and leaders and chief executives, but it's really, really important important that we understand and listen to the experiences of our frontline workers and act on those to make change happen. Um, just a reminder that we've got the Q&A going live. Uh, once we've heard from Rachel and Joe, we'll be uh, posing your questions to the full panel, um, so please do get involved. Um, but next up, Rachel, welcome to the conference. Good morning, everybody. Thanks very much, Katie, for the introduction. Thanks, Adrian, for that presentation. Um, yeah, so uh, good morning. I'm Rachel. I'm Policy and Communications Officer with the Frontline Network. Um, I'm hoping you'll be able to see some slides on the screen imminently. Brilliant. Um, yeah, so it's a pleasure to speak at this panel on valuing our key workers. I will start off by giving a brief insight into the Frontline Network um, and then share what frontline workers have told us about their recent experiences on the line during the pandemic. Um, so some of you might have heard of Symptom of the Fields charity. We're known for our BBC Radio 4 Christmas appeal and also for our provision of emergency crisis grants, um, which go out to people experiencing homelessness through their support workers across the United Kingdom. We launched the Frontline Network back in 2016 because we recognised that there was more that we could be doing to support people um, and the frontline, frontline staff working with people um, experiencing homelessness. So moving on to the next slide, please. At the Frontline um, Network, we support frontline staff, and by that we mean anyone who's paid, who's working with people experiencing homelessness, and that could be across the public um, sector, the statutory sector, or the voluntary sector. So types of roles this could include would be people working in outreach, housing, social work, and probation. Um, so moving on. 
So the overall aims of the frontline network, um, it's kind of trying to do different things to support those frontline workers. And that includes creating a space for them to share their experience and their expertise, providing resources um, so that they can support people that they're working with. Um, a big thing is highlighting it um, and sharing best practice within the sector. And then finally, amplifying the voices of frontline workers, um, which is something we're touching on a lot in this conference, um, so that they're listened to by funders and decision makers. And our work takes place across the UK. So both at a national level, we host events and offer funding. That could be for things like staff training and for new ideas coming through. Um, we also conduct research, which I'll be talking a bit about um, later on in this presentation. And that's uh, with the aim of gathering frontline worker views and trying to influence change. And then at a local level, um, we work collaboratively with eight partner organisations, which include Comorth Cymru, as um, Katie mentioned, and that's um, a way that we're, again, trying to provide further opportunities for staff to come together, share experiences and share their expertise. Moving on to the next slide. Yeah, so the key principle that's kind of running throughout all of our work is that um, it's led by frontline workers. So we believe that many of the system barriers and practical solutions to preventing homelessness can be identified and overcome on the front line. Um, so with that in mind, I'll move on now to sharing some headlines from our research with the Frontline Network. So every year since 2017, we have undertaken um, a survey with frontline workers to collect their views. And the results that I'll be sharing um, in the next few slides are from our latest survey, um, which asked 50 questions. Those questions spanned from how to access accommodation, um, how it's been accessing specialist support services since COVID, since the pandemic, as well as uh, the impact of the last year on frontline worker well-being. Um, so the survey itself was open for a three-week period in November 2020, and in total we received 930 responses from frontline workers across the United Kingdom. Um, so the full report itself will be published later on in 2021. Um, in the meantime, if you'd like to, you can access the previous year's report on our website. Um, and as I mentioned, I'll be able to share some headlines from the emerging, emerging findings um, with you now. So yeah, um, this kind of first slide is, uh, sorry, staying on the last one. Um, to start off with, it's really important to recognise all that's been achieved um, over the last year. There's been an incredible collaborative effort, as I think has been mentioned, um, by individuals such as yourself who are working on the front line um, across sectors. Um, it's supported thousands of people to access accommodation. Um, in Wales in particular, our survey um, that we undertook showed that there's real positivity about um, the government's response. So we have this, um, this figure which is saying that 81% of wildlife workers felt that commitment from their nation's government to preventing and relieving homelessness has increased. Um, and that's the highest compared to the other kind of three nations in the United Kingdom, which is interesting. So we can see that there's a great work achieved and that there's positivity that we're moving in a good direction. Um, and now moving on to the next slide. With that in mind, um, we can recognise that despite those achievements, the last year has been really challenging for frontline workers. Um, and this is both due to long-standing issues for the workforce, so things like um, funding cuts, high caseloads, um, practical issues like the challenge of finding suitable accommodation, um, but also new and increased challenges been brought by the pandemic. So the need to rapidly adapt models so that services can be delivered remotely, um, concerns about individuals' own health and health of um, their loved ones, and the risk of um, vicarious trauma from responding to particularly distressing situations. Um, so as a result of those things, um, many staff on the front line have been working in this mode essentially as part of a year. Um, and in our latest survey, this was kind of highlighted, um, the 73 73% of Welsh workers feel that their role has had a negative impact on their well-being. And this is a concerning figure. Um, we know that the well-being of frontline workers is important in and of itself, um, but we also know that poor well-being affects staff's ability to support others. So, for example, when staff, being, staff well-being is low, there's a risk of compassion fatigue or burnout. Um, services can stand to lose 
dedicated um, and skilled frontline workers and the individuals experiencing homelessness could lose trust or, or be re-traumatised um, through that experience. And moving on to the next slide. So frontline workers have also shared with us some of their thoughts on best practice when it comes to supporting work. There are a few different strands that come out here. Um, the first is the need to really feel supported and valued um, within their organisations. So this could take the form of having a line manager or a wellbeing lead who they can talk to and have open conversations with. It could also be practical things within the organisation. So if there, if it is feasible to have flexible working um, within the remit of their role, then that could be a, a beneficial um, change for some people. The second point we've got here is around having enough time to do people's jobs effectively. Um, so capacity continues to be a really significant issue. Um, and some front with the issue of job insecurity as well, which affects their ability to plan for the longer term and kind of have security looking forward. And then final one here is um, access to training and events, which we've heard can provide real opportunities for staff to learn and reflect. So this could be internally within the organisation, um, perhaps having supervision, opportunities to debrief before signing up from work at the end of the day. Um, it could also be accessing extra support, so training sessions um, that might be attended by members of staff on key areas like resilience and how to set boundaries. Um, these are some of the things that have come through from us in the survey as, as what helps and what works. So I guess to summarise, um, we've seen that the, the vital work of frontline workers do across Wales has become even clearer really over the last year. And as we come out of the other side of the pandemic, and try and build successes that have been had. had crucial that frontline staff have the support that they need to be able to effectively do their roles and do so in a way that's sustainable in the longer term. So at the frontline network, we're able to directly support frontline workers, for example, through some of the training opportunities that I've mentioned that are available nationally and also the amazing work of our partner. Um, so taking Come Off Cymru as an example, um, following the launch event that they had um, in December, I know Gareth and the team have been hosting uh, real events for frontline workers to come together, share their experiences and raise issues. And I think that the event happening at lunchtime today will be a really Really interesting one for us to talk about make like, their voices heard in the upcoming Welsh elections. Um, so there's, there's plenty of opportunities um, and what we're really working on is um, trying to amplify the voices of frontline workers so that we can take, take these issues forward. Brilliant. I guess just to finish up, I've got a final slide on um, how you can find out more and get involved with the Frontline Network. So our website's a really good starting point and I'll also highlight that our annual Frontline Worker Conference is coming up on the 24th of June, taking place online. So that's another opportunity to learn and discuss these topics. Um, so you can watch this space for an invitation. Um, thanks very much and I look forward to discussing questions. Thanks very much, Rachel. That was um, that was a really great insight into some of the views and experiences of frontline workers, and we're really looking forward to seeing that report published. and And we'll make sure that we circulate across Wales and make sure that people learn the lessons from that. and And I agree. Uh, please do check out the frontline networks resources. Please encourage your frontline staff to access those. Um, there's some really great events and training opportunities. Lots of them for free. Um, you know, information about how to access funding. Um, um, encourage your staff to attend the Frontline Network Wales events. Um, it's really important uh, now of all times that staff feel valued and listened to and that we're able to act on their views and concerns and, and make positive change happen. So thank you very much, Rachel. Um, our next speaker, I'm delighted to welcome Jo Glasgow from Unite the Union. I've known Jo for, jo for a long time and um, she's always been a big inspiration. Um, she's an activist at heart, both within her professional and personal life, and um, I know she's hugely, hugely respected across Wales for all that she's done um, in her career, but also in her own advocacy and activism um, as an unpaid carer. So I'm really, really pleased that Jo's here to talk to you, um, both from her perspective and from Unite, the trade union, um, but probably also some personal reflections as well. Um, jo, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, Katie. Um, morning all. Um, my name's Jo. I'm the Women and Equalities Officer for Unite Wales. Our union represents 1.2 million members across all sectors. 
Here in Wales, we represent 75,000 members in both the public and private sector. We also represent retired members and those currently out of work. Our members have been on the front line during this crisis and before, keeping our nation moving, ensuring vital services are delivered. Our NHS workers, social care workers, unpaid carers, our manufacturing workers, retail and hospitality, transport and local authority, to name a few. Workers have carried us through this crisis. These workers have always been there. Doing what at times is a thankless job for little pay. As Adrian has already highlighted, the majority of key workers we know are women. Some holding down three or four jobs to make ends meet. It has sadly taken this crisis to highlight the vital role these workers play in our day-to-day -day life. These workers have kept me and you safe, fed, cared for, and our economy moving. They've kept Wales moving and risked their own lives and safety in the process. We all know too well the stories of too many key workers that have lost their lives during this crisis. We know that the jobs seen as the highest value during this pandemic are often the lowest paid. How shameful is it that so many of those key workers are turning to food banks and struggling to survive themselves? Yet, yet UK government made clear these workers do not deserve a meaningful pay rise. Despite all the talk, they think that our health workers deserve a meaningful, shameful, sorry, shameful 1% pay rise. In Unite Wales, we believe clapping is simply not enough. We're demanding meaningful pay rises for our NHS workers and calling for an end to the pay, the, the and pay freeze for all public sector workers. Raising the minimum wage to £10 an hour will help 2 million key workers overnight. Just think about that. That can help 2 million key workers overnight. The subject of building back better, building back better and building back fairer has never been more important. And as a union, we are clear with our demands to UK government and Welsh government that as we come out of this crisis, we can't simply go back to business as normal. There are real opportunities here in Wales and I feel commitments that we can build on to ensure that our key workers are both recognised and valued in a meaningful way. Whilst UK government made it, made it clear its feelings towards NHS workers, Welsh government has shown a different approach. You may have seen that yesterday it was announced a one-off payment of £735 for all NHS and social care staff to be paid in May. This is separate to any pay award and goes some way to recognising the commitment shown by these workers. We want the UK government and Welsh government to actively look at similar recognition for all public sector key workers. We are currently, we are clear in our demands that workers and especially key workers will not pay the price for this crisis. Whilst I welcome having a Welsh government in Wales has offered us many advantages and a proactive approach for our social partnership working. It has meant that we have worked together through this crisis. However, we can't rest on our laurels. Whoever is in government post the election has to carry through on their firm commitment set out on the Fair Work Agenda for Wales. Ensuring tendering for social care is brought in-house when the opportunity arises will make a huge difference. It should never have been a profit-making venture. Neither can we ignore the consistent underfunding Wales receives by a UK government. This is under a cloud of continued austerity, which has meant uh, we are limited to carrying out what truly matters. The targeted support during this crisis via Welsh government has been ta targeted, I feel, where it's needed most. It has meant unpaid carers could apply for grants through their local services. It was literally a lifeline for so many people. Value in our key workers, I think it's been said before, means paying them a real living wage and ensuring good terms and conditions with that. More than that, it means secure employment free from zero, zero hour contracts and minimum hour contracts. I've said this many times, it should never have been a choice during this pandemic as to whether someone went to work sick because of SSP being inadequate or not being able to pay the bills. I was pleased to see at the time Welsh Government did step in with a £500 payment. Work has always been considered a route out of poverty, but when the opposite is the reality, we know we have to and must do better. 
It's no accident that unionised workplaces have better pay, safety and conditions. We have been there to support our members on the front line. We've made sure that adequate PPE was in place, workplaces were safe, and we pushed back against those employers who tried to use this crisis as an excuse to discriminate and exploit our workers. Conversations with government have been key to addressing the issues head on, and this proactive approach must continue post lockdown. We want to continue to ensure that workers are present in Welsh Government's strategy to build back better and fairer. Unite and other unions have been a key player in steering the crisis and the government's approach. Whoever is in power post May, our work will continue. Our key workers, wherever they work in Wales, in whatever sector, deserve our respect and to be recognised beyond this crisis. The commitment is, is there from government, I feel, but we need to build on it and keep pushing the agenda post-crisis. Valuing our key workers means paying them a wage that allows them to live with dignity and gives them the knowledge that they are truly valued by society. And thank you so much. Thanks very much, Joe. A rousing speech there as we uh, head into Senate elections. Um, thank you so much to our three panellists who've made some really brilliant, thought-provoking contributions today. Um, please do put your questions into the Q&A section on Hoover, um, and we've now got um, about 15 minutes to pose questions to the panel. So if I could welcome you all back, please. First up, um, I've got a question um, about the profile of, of homelessness, care and support staff. Um, so I think up to the pandemic, for many, um, they went about their job unnoticed, um, probably not recognised for the contribution that they make unless you happen to be in contact with one of those services. Do you feel that during the pandemic, the profile of whether it be homelessness or, or housing support or care workers, do you feel that that's been raised both within the public perception, but also with other professional groups who may not have noticed or valued them as much as as much as they could have done in the past? I don't know who wants to jump in first. I'm, I'm Adrian, more than happy to say, yes, I think so. I mean, you know, there's there's no doubt that, you know, um, things like the clapping campaign uh, did put social care as well as the NHS into the public consciousness in a, in a way that I, I'd never remember happening before. Um, I think, you know, there's there's two thoughts that go with that. You know, one is, as as um, I think it was uh, Joe said, you know, clapping isn't enough. Um, and, and we need to see that commitment to, to social care and other key workers expressed in a more practical way. And, and, and the other thing that we always have to be worry, worrying about is, you know, is how quickly, you know, uh, the, the media headlines change and the, and, the, and the public gaze moves on and so on. So, I think it's it's vital, you know, particularly as we come out of the pandemic, that we that we keep the interests of of all our key workers, and from my perspective, you know, particularly social care workers, um, in the public ga uh, gaze. Yeah, absolutely. And and Rachel, I guess that's part of the role of the frontline network is to try and make sure that those voices continue to be heard, and um, that they don't get forgotten about once we kind of exit out of this pandemic and that the, the work of homelessness staff, that we continue to make those voices heard and represented through the frontline networks work. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I think that's crucial that it's sustained and that some of the kind of recommendations and the learnings that are coming out from frontline workers that are taken forward. And I think the other thing that I guess the pandemic response highlighted is, um, you know, when we think of a uh, sort of a frontline worker who's responding to the issue of homelessness, we might have a, a one view, but actually there are so many different people who have been working together to respond. And so I think we need to recognise that even people attending this conference will be coming from very different places, bringing different experiences. Yeah, that. Absolutely agree. I think one of the brilliant things around the homelessness response has been the partnership working across agencies um, and a real sense that some of the red tape and bureaucracy was put to one side and that those who knew what they were doing, those professionals at the front line, were able to crack on and do what was necessary. Um, and I think really valuing the, the expertise that frontline workers bring, you know, they are the experts in delivering that on the front line. And sometimes it's about empowering them to do so. And, and I think particularly for homelessness workers, I think the reality is that you're unaware of them if 
you um, because most people luckily don't have to ever come into contact with homelessness services in a way that, you know, you, you do come into contact with the NHS regularly, regardless of what your background is. Um, for most people, luckily, they don't have any contact with homelessness services, but hopefully this pandemic has, has shown the importance of them moving forward. And, and Joe, you've been, um, you know, obviously championing the, the role and work and the profile of workers for many years. And have you seen a kind of change in perception as a trade unionist in terms of how the public and others view, view key workers? Yeah, I think that those workers, I think, were predominantly with the hidden workforce. I think they went about their business and got on with it day to day. And thinking about the NHS, it's the porters, it's the cleaners that are a part of this. And sometimes we give that image about the nurses who are absolutely on the front line, but it's the hidden workers as well that are our key workers and are, you know, in, in the chain are absolutely essential. So I think attitudes are changing, but it's exposed what we can do overnight, you know, the flexible working and working from home overnight almost it happened all, all overnight didn't it so I think there are things we've got to keep we've got a duty all of us to keep the momentum going and not let it be like you say a clap that once happened on a Thursday that now there's meaningful respect and meaningful changes they deserve a pay rise and a living wage they shouldn't be doing three or four jobs they shouldn't be turning to food banks I find it utterly shameful that those that are caring for our relatives for our you know our children are then having to turn to food banks it's it's wrong so there's something wrong and we've got to work together we can't allow it to continue because in years to come we'll be saying the same things our low paid social care workers it's not right so yeah absolutely and I think um a couple of you have touched on it but it's, it's probably important to remember how it felt for frontline workers in those first few weeks and months when there was very little known about the virus probably not great access to PPE and I wonder whether any of you have got reflections on how it did feel for frontline workers at that time um, for maybe people in the audience who are who are not involved in that that line of work and and maybe just remembering those reflections that people had those fear fear and anxieties that people had at the time I mean, I just start by saying, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, at the start of the of the pandemic, there was, you know, a, an incredible amount of of, of anxiety. Um, you know, we were uh, inundated with requests for advice and, and and guidance. You know, which we and others, you know, with help from Cumorth, you know, had to try and pull together as 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 fast as possible to to enable people to understand. You know what they were facing and, and how they could do it as, as safely as possible. Um, I, you know, thankfully, I think we, we got over that within, within, a, within a few months and the anxiety levels uh, stabilised, but, but initially it was a very scary time. Yeah, I was going to say, um, Katie, as well, yeah, the, the, the first couple of months were hugely stressful for those workers and the unions I think played a really pivotal role in reminding employers of their responsibilities as well because I think guidance was coming out and then there was the UK um, legislation coming down and Welsh government um, guidance so it was very very confusing at the time but I think the unions had a role in that um, and we did work with government to make sure that that guidance was getting out quickly and understandable um, you know understanded by those that, that needed it most I think. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, just the stories that we've kind of heard in terms of the speed of, of people changing, I, I'm sure we all went through it in, in some way, but changing where they're delivering frontline services and kind of pivoting that and really um, doing that, being so reactive. And so, like you say, dealing with changing information that's available, um, all, responding to all of that uncertainty and increased workloads and, and then kind of getting to a point where, you know, a few months down the line actually having a bit of space to step back and reflect and I think that's where we've kind of heard where people have then kind of come back to events and actually had space to think about um their well-being and kind of almost take stock it's been a bit delayed but I think people are now kind of thinking okay looking forward like what's kind of next how do we make this sustainable for us working in this space and for people that we're, we're working with yeah definitely and I think um it was so confusing at the beginning and there are many benefits to having devolved government in Wales and I think we've certainly seen some of that during the pandemic around the decision making here in Wales compared to over the border but it, it was really confusing there was 
guidance and statements, televised statements coming out from the, the government in Westminster and the government in Wales. And I know it was it was hugely, hugely confusing for everyone. And there was a real kind of leadership role, uh, both at Comorth and within organisations and the trade unions to try and make sure that the staff understood, you know, what the parameters were, how we could keep people safe. Um, and thinking about the different approaches, um, you know, in different parts of, of the UK, I guess, one of the reflections um, that we heard about yesterday, particularly in relation to the homelessness response, was around um, the cooperation and partnership that we've seen during this pandemic. And I think that where the voices of uh, workers and the organisations are around the table with government and can actively influence the policy and the decision making as it's being developed, I think that's that's really shown some benefits and you know Joe you've mentioned um you know trade unions been around the table uh Comorth's been around the table for many of those discussions what you know you probably talk to colleagues across the border and who may have had very different experiences to you but what have been the benefits of that I think we're proactive you know when it comes to well we've seen the adverse impacts of Covid on certain um groupings such as women and our ethnic minority community and actually having Jane Hutt around the table with us with the Welsh TV talking about it and having proactive approaches to health and safety and it not being you know Wales led the way with the two meter distancing didn't it that we were the first to do that and I think it's made a huge difference that actually when there are issues we can pick up the phone and we can resolve it quickly rather than it escalate into a to an issue and I think there's huge advantages to that and there's the commitment from Welsh Government we are recognised and in local authority for example in Caerphilly Council where we've worked with um, you know HR and the leader of the council we've been proactive it hasn't been you know nobody's health and safety is at risk it is the best way of working and it should it should have always been like that it shouldn't have took this crisis and I know um, government has got that commitment but I think whoever is in power post May that has to continue it cannot slide it's got to you know we've got to strengthen that because it ultimately this is about people, people's livelihoods it's about their safety they kept Wales moving and put their lives at risk and a lot of our ambulance workers lost their lives and it's you know it's it's sad but we've got to learn the lessons and not just another review for the sake of it and then not learning the lessons from how we handled this we've got to do, do better definitely and Adrian you know I guess that's something that you would advocate as well, that kind of being around the table, being part of that decision making process. I know it hasn't been perfect in Wales. I think certainly been better than over the border, but something that we need to build on going into the next administration. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, um, it, it's been it was and, and hopefully still is. Uh, we can, the crisis has gone down a little bit, so I'm not quite sure whether you're still meeting with ministers three days a week or, or whatever, like you did at one stage. But. But, you know, last year that to know that our representative bodies, you know, in all the different sectors were coming together and sitting around the table with government and you know, representatives from local government uh, working on this collaboratively and cooperatively. You know, absolutely. That was that was brilliant and it has to be sustained. And, and, and I guess I would um, I would add that, you know, something similar was happening down at local authority uh, levels as well and the engagement between. Uh, between local authorities who who are normally like the commissioners somewhat at arm's length from from outsourced social care providers um you know that distance was was instantly reduced people were, were around the table problem solving um together uh, and i would like to see that that carrying on i mean you know i i don't think we're going to go back to to you know everything being in the public sector again but but i do think we should all be in like the public service sector, whatever, whatever label you might might have on us, and and and, and absolutely core to the benefit of that is ongoing conversations and the pooling of of ideas and problem solving, rather than this, you know, I'm in one room, you're in another room type of, uh, you know, disaster that that, that grew on the back of of marketisation, that, that that mustn't be the future. Definitely. And I think, you know, the third sector, the not for profit sector has been incredibly important working in, in partnership with the public sector during this crisis. I think there are certain things that the third sector have been able to do because of the ability to be 
flexible and fleet of foot in a way that the public sector sometimes cannot be but where it's been done in partnership and where that trust has existed I think that's where we've seen some really fantastic outcomes and, and results for people on the ground and, and Rachel I guess you know from your survey uh, it's you know it's speaking to frontline workers across the different nations and I think you referenced in your presentation that um, in Wales, um, there was the, the results showed a, a much stronger feeling that the government was being proactive on homelessness, that, that maybe frontline workers were being heard a bit more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that was a really interesting finding that came out with it and supports what's been said here about, um, you know, there's been really good efforts to have people um, having that conversation and, and involving people and bringing people in. So really positive and I think it puts um, Wales in a really good place to like you say keep going with this and ensure that whether it's at a local level or at kind of national level the you know, key workers and people on the front lines are being uh, Absolutely. And I can show you, Adrian, that um, I've been in contact with the Welsh Government last night, this morning, and they've just <laughs> put a meeting in my calendar for 3.30 today. I don't think there's been um, certainly a weekday for the past year where I've not been meeting with Welsh Government every day. And they've certainly been sending me texts and emails across the weekend as well. So um, they're, they're probably the people I'm closest to at the moment. I've probably spoken to them more than my family over the last year. So we're continuing to make the voices of our of our sector heard and and um, making sure that they uh, they're fully incorporating the views of people working in our sector and our members um so yeah certainly continuing to play a very strong representative role um which is really great can can, um, can i ask you to 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 make sure that they um they they do slightly better in dishing out the 500 pounds to frontline workers than they than they did last year and they went on and on and on and uh, yes. yeah I'm, I'm sure some lessons have been learned but I'll absolutely feed that back and um, for the, you know uh, the broader audience that are here today um, we're hoping to have conversations um, with them about homelessness and housing support staff as well in the context of that payment so uh, we'll of course let members know as soon as uh, we know what's happening next um, to finish off the session, um, I was wondering, um, we've talked a lot about uh, pay, and that's absolutely critical. You know, Joe was right. It's an absolute disgrace that some of our hugely valuable key workers are queuing up food banks because they're not being paid enough. Um, Adrian talks a lot about the benefits that not only to the individuals, but to society and the local economy that, that paying people fairly would bring. But I wonder um, what are the things that, that you would say to organisations around what can be done non-financially? So what are the other things that organisations can do to make sure that frontline workers feel valued and supported? Don't know who wants to jump in first. Well, I, I, I'll jump in first, I think, um, you know, partly because whilst I was listening to Rachel, uh, you're talking about the, the frontline uh, workers network, you know, I was... I was, you know, challenging myself in terms of, of how well we do as an organisation in enabling our frontline support workers to have a real say. It's something we definitely aspire to. You know, we, we've become a multi-stakeholder cooperative, allow, allow workers to become members and elect reps and have a voice. A actually, COVID has made that quite difficult to, um, to, to follow through, but it's, it's something I'm really keen that we, you know, that that people feel respected not just because of what they get paid but because you know they're valued as human beings as adults as people with lots of experience with thoughts and ideas you know they don't just turn up do a do a shift and disappear you know that that's that's something I hope that we can get better at and, and across the sectors too. Thanks Adrian. I don't know uh, Joe. do you want to come in? Yeah I think Adrian's pretty much covered it off but I think where there are unions work with us and encourage your employees to join the union. I think that's the single biggest thing any any worker can do because with the protection of a union, if things do go wrong, we are there to support you. And, you know, workplaces having policies that are meaningful, so mental health policies, you know, family friendly policies, encouraging flexible working and just treating workers with dignity and respect is key. They are not just another number. They are the assets we've heard, haven't we, during this crisis, that our key workers have been the lifeblood of our economy. They've kept us moving. Well, that means respecting them in their work hours. You know, like like Adrian says, treating them as human beings. Dignity and respect is key, and policies that are fit for purpose 
and encouraging union organisation because those workplaces that do have us there are stronger workplaces as a result. So, Thanks very yeah. much, Joe. Rachel, any, any final thoughts from you, maybe reflecting on the things that Frontline Network have heard from frontline workers? Yeah, I think that you're, what has been said is completely right and that there are these non-financial ways that we can recognise and create a culture where um, frontline workers are being supported, whether that's within the organisation, like you say, with um, particular organisational policies or practices, just um, supporting them with training and kind of having that space where they can talk openly about what's happening um, and you know how that's affecting their well-being because that's clearly such an important issue that's affecting um, people on the front line and we need to be making sure that they're working in a way that's sustainable and so they continue doing this great work you know longer term um, we're not seeing turnover and we're not seeing people people struggling. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Rachel. And I think psychologically informed approaches are absolutely the, at the heart of that reflective practice, giving staff the trust, the space um, to talk about what they're experiencing, particularly where staff are, are doing traumatic roles, where they're hearing about lots of trauma from the people that they're supporting. Thank you so much to Joe, to Rachel and to Adrian. Um, that was a really great discussion. Um, I think there's some very clear messages there, not only for organisations, but for candidates standing in the Senate elections. Um, so thank you so much. Um, we'll be closing this session shortly, but we've got a really, really important discussion coming up next at 11 o'clock. Challenging racism and inequality. It's really important that we reflect on what we can do as individuals and organisations um, on the issue of racism. I think the past year has really shone a light on the importance of that. Um, and now is the time to act. We cannot wait any longer. I'm delighted that uh, Nazia Azad Warum will be chairing that panel um, with a group of people who will be talking about their experiences and what they want to see people do in their organisations and in society. So please uh, go for a cup of tea and join us uh, back at 11 o'clock for that really important discussion. Thank you very much to the panel. Diochen See you soon. Good guys. <laughs>